Unit 7, Indoor and Rooftop Gardens. Indoor gardens. Indoor vegetable gardens aren't a new thing. And even animals such as chickens and turkeys are largely produced indoors in traditional agriculture. And modern growing techniques and equipment such as LED lighting and hydroponics and aquaponics can make indoor gardens extremely productive, giving large yields in quite small spaces and scaling up to large spaces is quite possible. For the purposes of this unit, we're not going to consider greenhouse growing as indoor gardening, although technically it is. Um, however, we will take a look at greenhouses uh, in the section on rooftop gardens. So what are issues with indoor gardening? Well, it's very different from growing crops outdoors for several reasons. First, the light is generally much more limited indoors, even in a south facing window. Space is usually also much more limited indoors. Soil or growing media used in, for indoor growing has to be brought in, mixed appropriately. We discussed growing media for containers in a previous unit, and is usually available in smaller amounts than if you're just planting in the soil outdoors. If growing indoors under lights, then the cost of the fixtures, the bulbs, and the electricity has to be taken into account. And finally, growing containers must be well designed for the area that they're in to prevent soil and water from leaking. So what are some of the advantages of indoor gardening? Well, they do have some advantages over outdoor gardens. Um, you can grow an indoor garden in an apartment or a condominium where you may not have any outdoor space available to grow. You can grow crops in the off season, in the wintertime. Um, crop pests such as weeds and insects are usually much less problematic indoors and even a lot of diseases of plants. Um, because of their usually smaller size, indoor gardens are often easier to maintain. And plants grown indoors help clean indoor air and provide oxygen. So what are methods of indoor gardenings? Well, there are lots of methods, but the two most common are container gardening, discussed in a previous, previous unit, and hydroponics, also discussed in a previous unit. Um, aquaponics is becoming more and more used, but still doesn't approach um, either hydroponics or container gardening in um, the number of indoor gardens used. Um, and if you're growing in a greenhouse or a hoop house, um, plants can also be planted directly in the ground, um, not necessarily requiring containers. Artificial light. This is one of the biggest issues. Light is one of the biggest issues of indoor growing. And if sufficient natural light isn't available, it can be supplemented or even completely replaced by artificial light. There are four main light sources being used as grow lights today. Fluorescent lights, both in the tube form and as compact fluorescent bulbs. Sodium vapor lights, which are similar to the uh, orange to yellowish street lights we see. Metal halide bulbs, which provide intense light, but also generate a lot of heat and require special handling and fixtures. And LEDs or light emitting diodes, which are the newest source of grow lights. They're very energy efficient compared to other sources of light and produce very little heat. However, they're still quite expensive at this time, although the costs are dropping rapidly as the technology of producing LEDs improves. Next, we need to look at light spectrum because not every light source is suitable for growing plants indoors. The light must have the pro proper spectrum or range of light colors to allow plants to grow efficiently. The spectrum of a light source is called its color temperature, and it's measured in degrees Kelvin. Red light 
has a color temperature of about 1500 degrees Kelvin. Blue light, on the other end of the spectrum, has a color temperature of about 8000 degrees Kelvin. Most crop plants do best when the light source is close to daylight in its color temperature, which is between four and 6,000 degrees Kelvin, but generally recognized as 4,200 to 5,000 degrees by most uh, light source manufacturers. Metal halides and fluorescence can match that spectrum pretty closely. LEDs don't, however, LED grow lights use a mix of colors of individual LED elements to generate the proper spectrum. So overall, they can be a really, really close match, as good as fluorescence. And sodium vapor lights tend to be at the red end of the color uh, temperature scale and somewhat less effective. The next thing to think about is light intensity. Uh, this is something that, that sometimes isn't thought through when people go to grow things under lights indoors and wonder why they're not producing, the plants aren't producing as well as they could. Um, it's a good chance that the light, and if the color temperature is correct, that the light intensity is way too low. Consider this, sunlight has an intensity of between 1300 and 1400 watts per square meter on Earth. That's the incandescent light equivalent. Like if you took regular light bulbs and tried to light it, you would need 1300 to 1400 watts of those bulbs on one square meter to equal sunlight. Now, let's think of a set of four fluorescent tubes. They're the typical fluorescent tubes. They're four feet long. Each is about 40 watts. And let's place them one foot above the plants. And that would make them cover about one square meter. Now, fluorescent lights generate about three times the light per watt of incandescent lights. So these 40 watt bulbs are putting out roughly 120 watts uh, equivalent incandescent light each. And we have four of them. So that means our effective wattage is around 480 watts per square meter with these four lights a foot above the plants. And the actual wattage is somewhat less because of light scatter and loss. So we're lighting our plants with about one quarter the intensity of sunlight. It's very important to use bright lights close to the plants when growing in artificial light. There's yet another complicating factor in using artificial light. Light follows something called the inverse square law. We're not gonna get into heavy mathematics or anything here. Um, just pay attention to what this means. It means that light intensity is inversely proportional to the square of the distance from the light source. Well, what does that mean? Okay, simply put, if you double the distance from the light to the plant, the light intensity reaching the plant isn't cut in half, it's quartered. You're getting one quarter the amount of light on the plant. Here's a solid example. If you put a light six inches from the plant, and then you double that distance to 12 inches away, the amount of light striking the plant isn't one half the amount that it was at six inches. Rather, it's one quarter the amount it was when the light was six inches away. Now, if we move the light 24 inches away, we're doubling the distance again from 12 inches to 24 inches, the amount of light is one quarter what it was at 12 inches, or 1 16th the original intensity small changes in the distance of the light from the plant can make big differences. Photoperiod. We've discussed photoperiodism in a previous slide, but we'll kind of recap here. Many plants exhibit photoperiodism, which means they react to changes in the length of the day. This is one of the ways that plants know when it's time to flower. Now, they're not actually measuring the length of the day, they're measuring the length of darkness. 
They contain a chemical that changes form almost immediately on exposure to bright light. Then when it becomes dark, this chemical slowly changes back to its original form. By measuring the percentage of change of this chemical, the plant measures the length of darkness. This has implications for growing plants under artificial light. Because we're totally in charge of the light now, rather than nature, we must make sure to give plants the minimum length of night that's required to induce flowering if we want flowering to produce fruits and vegetables like tomatoes or peppers or whatever. Some plants don't need to flower to produce their crops, such as leaf crops like lettuce or arugula or something like that. But we need to be cognizant of this if we're trying to grow vegetables that require flowering. So we'll look at some grow lights here. This is a typical fluorescent, four tube fluorescent fixture. The bulbs are about four feet long. If this is the only source of light, you don't have sunlight coming in from any other source, then the fixture should be placed only a few inches from the plants. Mounting the lights so that they're hanging from a pulley system allows you to easily raise the lights and maintain the proper distance as the plants grow. These fixtures are quite inexpensive for two and four tube fixtures. The lights bulbs themselves are only moderately expensive, but they last quite a long time. And they're very energy efficient compared to incandescent lights. These are LED grow lights. And LED lights combine different colors to provide the full spectrum required by the plants. Um, what you can see here is, you know, this light here on the left has more reddish color to it. This one here on the right, a bit more bluish. And when those beams are combined, you get about the right color temperature for a daylight bulb. Um, more modern um, LED grow lights actually have the, the red and the blue mixed in the same fixture. So imagine, you know, many of these lights, individual LED elements in here, um, you know, being red, some being blue, and so the same fixture, and it mixes them together so you don't have two completely separate things. These are extremely efficient compared to incandescent lights for the amount of light that they put out. They also generate very little heat. However, they are still quite expensive to purchase, but as I've mentioned before, those costs are coming down. Metal halide lamps. These are used for a lot of purposes. Um, they're common in automotive headlights, um, and they're usually the types of lights that are used on athletic fields at night. Metal halide lamps operate under high pressure and require special fixtures. The bases may look like a standard screw-in base, but they're a completely different size and they won't work on a regular incandescent um, screw-in type of base. Uh, they also contain mercury, so when disposing of them, they need to be disposed of as toxic waste. They require a warm-up period of from somewhere between 5 and 20 minutes before they produce the full light output. And I should mention that fluorescents typically require a warm-up period of up to 5 or so minutes before their light output is maximized. Um, also, if they're turned off, for any reason, a power outage, or you simply flip the switch, they require a cool down and reset period of up to 30 minutes before you can turn them back on again. So if you accidentally flip the switch and turn off a metal halide light, and then go and flip it back on again, again, it's never going to come back on if you flip it on right away. It may make some buzzing noises, it may not, but it's not going to light up. You need to turn off the power to it and let the entire fixture cool down 
for as much as 30 minutes before you can turn the lights back on again. This is a metal halide bulb, and you can see um, the base of the bulb uh, does resemble an incandescent screw-in bulb. Uh, it's a different size, though, and it won't fit a normal uh, light fixture. Uh, inside, there is um, relatively high pressure, and the uh, bulb itself also contains mercury, usually in a secondary capsule inside. Sodium vapor bulbs, we're not going to really take a look at. Um, they're occasionally used because they can often be had for low price as surplus um, from old street lights or outdoor fixtures on the sides of buildings. Um, but they're not extremely efficient in terms of plant lights and are not recommended. So what crops can you grow indoors? Well, just about anything you could grow outdoors could be grown indoors, but you're primarily limited by light and space. If you have south-facing windows or you have uh, sufficient artificial lights, um, there are many crops that you can grow and then space becomes the limiting factor. Some of the most commonly grown indoor crops include the herbs, basil, rosemary, chives, thyme, parsley, that sort of thing. Leafy vegetables like spinach, lettuce, arugula, small root crops, radishes, carrots, turnips, some legumes such as beans and peas, and large crops such as tomatoes and peppers if you have sufficient room and sufficient light. Tomatoes and peppers in particular really love high light. They love warm to hot temperatures, um, and they generally require a lot of room. Other indoor crops? Well, in addition to plants, some animals are suitable for indoor production as well. Fish, as we saw in the section of aquaponics, can be grown inside synergistically with plants, um, which makes them kind of a nice adjunct to uh, indoor gardening. And then fowls, such as chickens and turkeys, are currently produced largely indoors, seldom outdoors in large farms, um, though they use specialized buildings. So that completes part one of this unit.